Hello and welcome to Somerville Media Center Live for May 13th, 2020. I'm Joe Lynch. Joining us today are Chair of the Somerville School Committee, Carrie Norman, and Chief of Staff of the Somerville Public School System, Dr. Jeff Curley. Welcome to both of you. Carrie, how are you doing today? Uh, well, thank you for having us. Uh, it's day to day, right? It's uh, some days are better than other days. Uh, I have a sophomore at the high school. I have a freshman in college who is home. Uh, there's tests and work to do. And then some days we just say we got through the day and that's a great thing and we're all healthy. Um, well, I, that's personally, uh, it's been a very, very, very busy time in the schools. We, uh, it, a lot of it may be invisible to the community, but the amount of work that our educators and our staff are doing right now it is phenomenal. The reinvention of the delivery of education, how do you get food and diapers to kids, how do you address mental health uh, needs, especially as the number of our, uh, affected people in our community is going up. So, and we're trying to figure out how to do a budget in a time when uh, no one knows what this is going to look like and there's no real information. So, uh, I, okay. I'm still grateful to be in Somerville. That's what I will say for the moment. Yes. Right. Thanks. Uh, Dr. Curley, that's the last time I'm going to address you using the word doctor. Is that okay for today? Jeff is great. Okay. <laughs> Jeff, how you doing? Great. Thank you. Yeah, I, oh, similar to Carrie, just juggling. We've got um, three little ones at home, five, three, and a six-month-old. So uh, trying to make that work and help them through the adjustment. My, um, my partner and I are both still working and uh, every day is a, a new adventure and a, and a juggle. But uh, it, it has been, it has certainly been interesting, I'll, I'll say that. Well, I'm glad to hear that both of you are coping. Um, one of Thanks. the things I wanted to talk about today, and we'll get into it a little later, or the mental health consequences on the student population yeah. of what this is doing to them. But I'm gonna start off with Jeff, if you don't mind, Carrie. Um, sure. We're gonna talk a little bit about um, Jeff and Superintendent Mary Skipper's efforts so far. Um, what we know as of today, since the school year was canceled. Jeff, if you wanna take it away and give it kind of a brief overview there. Sure. Um... So I, I think, you know, now we're in, I believe, week 10 since the closure. Um, and, you know, speaking personally, uh, both as a parent and the Somerville resident, I think, you know, if you didn't have a deep and abiding love for teachers and what they do on a day-to-day -day basis, you do now. You know, we've had a, a reinvention of remote education yeah. like this country's never seen. And I think it's difficult to talk in generalities about this because each family circumstance is different. Um, each child's developmental stage is different. And, you know, what our educators have done to essentially turn on a dime and try to keep the connections with their kids, yeah. um, make sure that they're still engaged, make sure that they're still on track um, and do that, frankly, in spite of the technology and the gap that we now have, um, I think has been pretty incredible. You know, as a district, what we've tried to do is make sure basically that the, that the hierarchy of needs are being met for all of our students. And, you know, starting from the position of the whole child, as the school committee has, has always really been committed to, to say, what do we need to do to stand up food and make sure no one's food insecure that we have remote mental health services in place, that we're meeting the emotional needs of students. Um, all of those things turned on on that first Monday after we closed. So we started giving out over a thousand meals that first Monday. Um, you know, we had our counselors already on um, Zoom and Google Meet talking to students, making sure they were okay and that they were working through this transition. And then, you know, we've had a lot of learning as adults about how do we do this effectively? What training do we need to provide our, our teachers to make sure they can use these digital platforms to reach students that we're tracking engagement that we have every student accounted for and that we know how they're doing. I, you know, I, I'm not, I wouldn't say that this is not gonna be a difficult period for a lot of our students. Obviously this is a hard change to make 
but I think as a system, um, we've had a lot, a lot of teachers and community members step up to make sure each student is individually accounted for and um, taken care of. And that's something I'm incredibly proud of. I, you know, I think cities in many ways are, are some of the hardest hit in this, but have done some of the most innovative work and pulled together as a community um, to respond and meet the need. Terrific. Terrific. Carrie, I want to ask you from the school committee side. Um, Jeff, is, uh, Jeff is the chief of staff for the Somerville Public Schools, working directly with Superintendent Mary Skipper. From the government side, the school committee has its yeah. responsibilities. As chair, what are we seeing right now on the ground today for the, for the um, school committee? Well, there, so, I mean, right now, primarily, by this time, in a, if it was a typical year, we would have had many, many office hours, uh, a public hearing on the budget, a lot of input, a lot of looking forward uh, and building on a, a very strong foundation. And and we've had to put a lot of the work on hold except for the, the budget and, and direct student needs. I mean, I, as chair, I speak with the superintendent uh, every day, multiple times a day. So we, a lot of it has been supporting her in that, this work, but also some of the invisible work. We've done three rounds of uh, memorandums of understanding of agreements with all of the unions, right? This is, this is not only a different um, education model, it's a different work model. And so there, that has been a huge amount of work. I have to say the flexibility and the, the commitment to students uh, and, and trying to balance out the commitment to students, the accountability, and also realizing that our educators are often, uh, they have their own children at home or their own health needs or their own, you know, any one of us going to the grocery store is in, an adventure at best, right? So they're also navigating all of those logistics and moving forward. I mean, there's some considerations that we have to start to think about now in terms of going back to school, like developing a mask policy. We don't have anything like that. How do we, and, we, and we're just at the beginning phases of how do we develop policies and think through how do we bring students and staff back safely, all right? We know some basic things like, you know, plexiglass, like what you see at the supermarket in front of uh, open windows, but we've got more complex situations. You know, we have staff and students who have uh, immune compromised health conditions, asthma. So how are we going to bring First, first and foremost is how do we bring people back safely when we get guidance to be able to do that. And uh, I have to say, uh, Jeff is part of this too, for two or three years now we've had what's called the children's cabinet, which is school staff, community partners, and city staff who have been working on how do we develop wraparound services. And I am so grateful that we have that foundation because when we talk about uh, within four days, how do you deliver meals? Uh, it, it has not just been just school staff, although school staff has been phenomenal. It's city, it's our, it's residents, it's families, it's it's 20 somethings who have more time to be able to help it. And so it, it's, it's really been a community effort. Um, your question about what the school committee is doing, in some ways, we don't know what kind of policy changes we, we're going to need to make. I mean, what we do know is we have a lot more to learn about this disease. We need have a lot more to learn about public health and safety and that uh, we need to be continue to be flexible and to keep our students and staff at the focus. How do we keep people safe? So Carrie, it's fair to say that pre-COVID, um, the educational systems in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts under the federal you know, Department of Education, there were guidelines and everybody had to kind of follow those guidelines. There was mm -hmm, some, mm -hmm, some mm -hmm. freedom that the individual school districts had trying to tailor those guidelines to the specific needs of kids. Absolutely. Those rules and those guidelines have to be rewritten almost completely when it comes to how do you provide for the safety and the health of the children who are in the education system while giving them the education that's being mandated, because this isn't a case of where Carrie Normand and the Somerville School Committee and Jeff Curley and Mary Skipper from the superintendent's office can create their own rules. 
we have to be looking towards the federal guidelines, the state guidelines, and then any local guidelines that we choose to implement. So without the federal and the state guidelines, yeah. it's, it's a fairly impossible job for the school committee, the city, and the superintendent's office to say, this is what we're gonna do moving forward. Is that a fair assessment? Um, I would also put, there's another variable in there is, uh, and I've been spending a lot of time, it's not the same to be able to be out in the community, but uh, when Jeff mentioned, you know, each family, each student has their own particular needs. Uh, I was speaking with someone who's immune compromised yesterday. It, that, it, that hadn't occurred to me yet, right? What are the student needs? Last week, uh, the school committee met with teen empowerment. And so getting information from, directly from the, our, our, our teens and what's this, what has this experience been for them so far? What has worked, what hasn't worked? What would they like to see more of, maybe less of? So in addition of getting guidance from uh, the state or the feds, we also, we know our, our community well, but this is such a, uh, I don't want to say unhinged. Complex, are, complex. Yes, yeah, such a complex situation that it's surfacing even more um, individual needs. And so it's both looking for guidance, but it's also listening incredibly hard to the members of our community and to know what it is that they, they need. And a couple of quick questions for either one of you. You, you had both you know, talked about at the very beginning of the pandemic when decisions were being made, one of the primary things that all educators are concerned about is, you know, their safety. Um, right. So one, a secondary and maybe not secondary too far behind is food, shelter, and clothing. So immediately the school system went into action to, by trying to feed some kids because you do that during the day anyway. Yes. So we couldn't just completely eliminate that. From a shelter standpoint, um, do we have, has it been brought to your attention about some of those kids that are homeless in the Somerville public school system and how are we going to address that for them? Um, Jeff is Jeff is deep in the operations side of that. Yes, okay. there's homeless families, but we also have families who are, well, I'll, I'll let Jeff speak to it. He's, yeah. He has done a phenomenal work on this. Okay. Jeff? Yeah, the, the Somerville Family Learning Collaborative um, which many in the community are probably familiar with, essentially the, the engagement arm of the district um, has a, a dedicated staff member that's in touch with any student that is homeless or in transient housing. Um, we've been uh, working to get all of them either direct internet connection or a Wi-Fi hotspot to make sure they can stay. There's not a, a um, connectivity gap, um, a, a Chromebook or a tablet, depending on their age, um, so they have a device to connect into. And then we've been working very closely with the city uh, through what Carrie said, the, the children's cabinet and the relationships that had been built between the director, Doug Crest, and Health and Human Services, the mayor's office, to make sure anybody in unsafe housing or um, if they have a member of quarantine can be relocated, that we're getting them essential services delivered um, the city's been working on laundry service. We're delivering food. Um, so we're trying to adapt to the realities of individual students. And again, just make sure we understand what are the particular circumstances of every single student in the district and how can we help them meet their needs. And in some cases, the district can do that. In other cases, we need to work with a community partner or work with a city partner. Um, but I think it's been you know, because of the relationships built and the, the trust that was there, a fairly seamless process. I'm, I'm proud, you know, that we've integrated a lot of these services together, recognizing that, you know, a student in a homeless situation has a variety of needs that um, we need to, to bring resources to bear on. So that's been, uh, I think, one of the, the really exciting, um, I, it, 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 up, uplifting amidst all this difficult news, the uplifting thing of how this city has really pulled together to meet the needs of all students. So that's the encouraging part is that, you know, there's no little kingdoms that have been established. Everyone's working together to a common goal. Let me, let me ask another question about when we're talking about certain segments of the uh, school population, there are some kids that just did not have the equipment, laptops, Wi-Fi yeah. connections. 
what have we done for those kids in order to keep them in a virtual learning mode? Yeah, I mean, it's exposed the fact that digital inequality is the same thing now as educational inequality. And obviously, if you can't connect, if you don't have a laptop or you don't have a reliable internet connection, it's almost impossible to learn in this circumstance. So our IT mobilized immediately. We used the food distribution sites as points of access uh, to safely distribute um, 1,200 Chromebooks to students in grades 3 through 12. We gave out 250 tablets to the younger students, the pre-K to 2 students. Um, for special education students, we've given out over 100 iPads with particular curriculum for um, that group. And then, you know, a challenge that has been exposed nationally, I think, is, is still high-speed internet and home-based internet. Um, we, we have over 450 families in our district that don't have a reliable connection. Um, so we immediately set to work with, uh, with Comcast as a partner that had been um, putting forward a, um, a service for two months free internet for anybody that was a free or reduced price lunch eligible student or household. And we extended that out to six months. We may extend that more depending on what happens in the fall and into the winter, but we're um, offering any family that needs that six months free internet. Um, we have reached over 200 of those 450 families with a direct now home internet connection. We have um, wireless hotspots that we're bringing into families that we can't directly connect up with for whatever reason and um, meeting that, that gap as, um, as quickly as we can, recognizing that that's critical to keeping the, the learning and instruction going. Gary, I, I want to ask you very briefly about and I know there are no answers. You know, yeah. the, um, the budget for the school committee, um, you folks have to start working on that or you have been working on it and trying to figure out how you're gonna come up with a school budget with so many uncertainties. Can you just tell us and the viewers where we are in that, that planning? Yes, uh, I can tell you that the, the, the budget that we were developing the beginning of March is, is no longer. Uh, we just had a finance meeting on Monday, and I believe those documents are up on the website, and we, we will be continuing the meeting. I think it's every week or every other week uh, to develop it. What's difficult is we don't know from the city what we'll be getting. The city doesn't know from the state what we'll be getting. The state doesn't expect that they'll have a budget until August. Um, so what we do know is that Revenue is significantly down, and and as you've heard from Jeff, uh, just uh, providing food, and it's not just food for our students. Uh, they can pick up food, the grab and go meals for a whole family. We are not checking any identification. We just want people to be fed. Uh, the the expense of the technology is increased. It's there's going to be the student mental health needs that we already have. Uh, robust services, but they are not going to, we're going to need more. I mean, what we know is uh, kids being isolated is not healthy. We know kids who, who may be accessing, if they were getting individual counseling in school, they may not be accessing it at home now for a variety of reasons, whether it's uh, sick family members, they're working, they're taking care of younger siblings. I mean, it is to make a list of the things that we don't know that that are going to need uh, more resources is, is phenomenal. So, but, but Carrie, it is fair yeah. to say that a education system budget during a pandemic. Yes, is, is looking gonna, very different. Yes. Is looking very yes. different. And it's gonna increase the cost yes. of educating. And yes. in some instances, there are programs and people, I hate to say it, but and other things that will have to be cut. Uh, yes, and, and this isn't just about the FY21 budget, which starts in July. Uh, we're talking about right now. Uh, we know that the revenue is down. It, to, to think of this last quarter of the, this fiscal year uh, as the same is not, uh, it's just not realistic. But we are, this, you know, all, all spending has been, except for what's absolutely 
spending has been shut down, I am very, very, very proud to say that our regular um, regular pay for all of our employees has continued through the end of this fiscal year. It is something that speaks to our values. It speaks to who we are. Uh, but it also, going forward, we're going to have to look at the budget in a different way. I mean, we were looking, you know, I know the city's got a rainy day fund, free cash, but that, that money is being spent quickly. Uh, anything that we have left, uh, if we can give something back to the city, um, how can we help? Because what we do know is this isn't going away. This isn't, this is not going to be a one year problem and so whatever resources we have now we need to be able to think this this quarter this school year next school year I mean I, I keep hearing it's going to take two to three years to come back fully financially so uh, the priorities are now and, and will continue to be how do we preserve uh, essential services for students and and preserve jobs as best we can so there's more to come more to come on the budget. There's but more to come. And, and we, I mean, on Monday night, we had a uh, hundred and over, I think 130 people attend a finance meeting virtually. That has never happened before. We don't even get those numbers of a public hearing. If you get right. 30, that's well attended. People are paying attention. And I would encourage the public to continue to, because it's going to be changing uh, rapidly. So I, I, you know, I promise both of you, I'm not going to ask a question that obviously we don't have the answer to, but Jeff, I want to put it back to you. I, I know Mary Skipper and the rest of the public health folks are looking at the emotional effects that this is having on kids. And and Carrie, if you want to jump in on the scholastic effects, but let's let's Jeff, if you can kind of encapsulate for the viewers. What effect is this having on the scholastic and the um, emotional emotional health of our students? Yeah, and I, I mean, I want to be careful that, again, not to make any generalities. I think this is unique to each household and often to each student. Um, yeah. We're yeah. having, you know, the counseling teams at each school meet on a weekly basis to check in and see um, of the students that they're worried about or having or have concerns about um, that they're forming a plan for and um, and engaging services to, to make sure those students are okay. You know, we're in regular contact with on a weekly basis with um, SPD with the mayor's office to see what they're seeing on the broader level as they engage the community and we predictably, I think, are, are seeing concerning signs that this is taking a toll on families, it's taking a toll on individuals, um, on parents, um, you know, on frontline workers. This is obviously an extremely difficult period for everyone, but people are disproportionately affected. Um, and so we're trying to make sure that the resources that we can bring are going to the students and the families that are most vulnerable, that are most in need of our support, um, that we're doing that again in a way with our partners like Riverside and, and others, uh, after school providers, anybody with relationships that are that they can reach students, um, we're, we're calling on to be in touch and make sure that they're, um, that they're in contact and that they're keeping that connection in place. And you know, I think in the fall, we're gonna have a big lift to, to bring people back into a regulated state into um, a sense of normalcy. We'll have some remediation work to do on the instructional side. Um, and, you know, I, I think it will take time for a, a lot of families and students to work through this. Uh, but we're trying to do everything we can now to make sure we're keeping that connection in place that we're really following and meeting the needs of students yeah. um, as we see them. Yeah. Well, it's interesting that you say about, you know, uh, checking on students because as you know the media center is a partner with the yeah. Somerville public school system and we had to make a very painful decision this past Monday that our in-studio classes will not be held this summer um, primarily because the board and I both felt and along with Heather McCormick that safety and the protocols that we will have in place uh, we're just not there yet in order to bring kids back into that building during June, July, August. 
So um, Heather McCormick, who is one of our brilliant stars, has already developed her virtual learning. She's rearranged it um, and her classes are filling up. So it's a case of where she's constantly checking on the 40 to 65 kids that do business with us and their parents. Um, so your job, um, both the school committee and the, and the district, it's a yeoman's piece of work to try to make sure these kids are all healthy and engaged during the summer, let alone what happens in September, um, because the recreational programs are being canceled left and right, any high touch activities are being canceled. I wanna move into one other piece though. Um, Dr. Fauci testified this week in front of the CDC. He's talking about um, the health consequences of opening up too soon. We've all seen the reports that um, younger children may be not as um, affected by COVID, but there are some things that are popping up that we just don't know. How is that going to affect the decision to reopen Massachusetts schools, Somerville Public Schools. I, I mean, who's who's at the helm of that on the city side? Is that the director of public health, Doug Kress? Yeah, it's a combination of Doug, uh, Doug Kress and um, some of the mayor's office staff, uh, our, our team. Um, we're looking at the trends both statewide and in Somerville on a daily basis. I mean, one of the positive trends you're seeing here is obviously a rise in testing and a decrease in the percentage of positive tests relative to the number of tests out there. So we, we will keep an eye on that. We'd like to obviously continue to see that go down. We're testing more people, but fewer of those people are testing positive. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're tracking on, a, on a, a literal daily basis kind of what's happening in the community. I'm, I'm proud that we've been often ahead of the state in taking action universal testing, enclosure, um, you know, it, it probably shouldn't be that way. And we'd love more guidance, both from state and federal authorities on how to think about these challenges, um, because in many ways they're not unique to Somerville, but um, in the absence of necessarily all of that guidance, I think we have got a great team making decisions and we're doing it based on data. Um, that's not to say it's not going to be an extremely complicated uh, and challenging fall decision, and we're not going to have to keep an eye on it very, very closely right. into the winter. Right. Jeff, you and Carrie both have, and, and superintendent of schools, and all of the teachers and the staff, um, as well as the students and their parents, are going to have a lot of work to try to figure this out. So I made the commitment to Carrie and to Mary Skipper that you have a permanent place here at the Somerville Media Center every Wednesday at two. Apologies to, for those who are gonna tune in uh, to see Mary Skipper today, but she is, um, she is a woman in demand these days <laughs> for a lot of meetings. She so Carrie, we've got about 10 seconds left. You as our focal point for the school committee, Jeff, you and Mary Skipper, you're welcome back on the show anytime any place, but two o'clock on Wednesdays, we got a slot reserved for both of you. Thank you so much, Joe, because any kind of connection, both getting information out and getting it back is how we're gonna make better decisions. So thank Great. you. Great, I thank wanna you, thank Joe. you. Love to I be wanna back. thank you both for the Somerville Media Center Live. I'm Joe Lynch, we'll see you next time.